What's up? This is Eric Ong, and today I'm here with Igor Kafetz. He's an Amazon best-selling author of Lease Building Lifestyle, Confessions of an Email Millionaire, and the founder of the, of the Lease Building Lifestyle, an online academy training people how to become financially free with email marketing. So welcome to the show, Igor. It's good to be here, man. Thanks for hosting me. I'm, I'm excited. Excited to, to chat. It's been a long time coming. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, really cool. I've known Igor for at least a year or two now. So Igor, maybe you could start sharing, but what, what is e-farming? What is lease farming, et cetera? And then we'll go on from there. Yeah, I've, um, you know, I started online. Um, I was a part of an MLM. Uh, that was my really just en the entry into the world of making money uh, in general, because I come from a very traditional background where my mom was a music teacher. My dad was an army uh, man. I mean, he was a soldier for the, the vast bulk of his life. And so, you know, my mom's parents were uh, a nurse and a school teacher, and my dad's parents were um, a school principal and a factory worker. So the, you know, when I was growing up, the idea was that I had to study well, get good grades, and, you know, uh, you know, hope that I'll get a good job. And by the time I'm 40, 45, maybe get promoted to like a senior position. And, you know, th that'll be my life. And I really subscribed to that idea until I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that sort of got me to realize that making money is actually not about education, that, you know, B students are usually the ones who employ A students or A students work for the government and C students employ B students or something like that. But, you know, the idea was, you know, it's you don't have to be the smartest uh, academically to make a lot of money and, and making money actually has a lot to do with things that are unrelated to to your grade in, grades in school. And so from that point, I, I kind of switched directions. I flipped the table and I started looking for ways to make money. And because I had no sense, no business ideas, no capital, uh, MLM seemed like the right way to go for me. I certainly wasn't equipped to invest in real estate or start like a, a software company or anything because I never had any coding skills or web development skills. And, and so I went and I, you know, uh, kind of got to know firsthand what it's like to maybe pitch people, get rejected, uh, try to prospect for myself, try to lead generate, use social media, content creation. And, and all of that was very, very challenging. And also very embarrassing because oftentimes when you use social media, your friends and family start asking you weird questions. You know, they really start seeing you a little bit differently. And all of a sudden you don't get as many wedding and birthday invites as you used to. Um, so so I, I then started uh, following a lot of people in the affiliate marketing space. Affiliate marketing as I'm sure your audience uh, uh, knows, it's it's when you promote someone else's product and you get paid a commission uh, when the sale takes place. Now, there's lots of different forms of affiliate marketing. It could be, you know, sometimes you get paid per lead or per click, but for the most part, the traditional sense, you refer somebody to a website that sells a product and if they buy the product, you get paid a great commission. And so I really like the idea of affiliate marketing. It made sense for me because it's kind of sort of like the MLM industry where you get paid a commission for somebody using your product. It's just you don't need to keep motivating them and do energy yells and get into hotel meetings. You can actually do it from your laptop. And um, I noticed all the super affiliates that I was following, people who are making a lot of money with affiliate marketing, they were always doing something called mailing. You know, anytime I would look at the leaderboard, you know, whoever was running the leaderboard um, and be like, oh, this person's making 50 sales. This person made 20 sales. This person has $10,000 bonus. This person's made $100,000 in commissions. Um, they would also uh, follow that up with something like, keep mailing, keep mailing, mail now, mail today, mail three times on Sunday. It's like mailing. What are they mailing? What is that? Are they sending, you know, mail pigeons? Or are they, you know, issuing a post? What's going on? And and so I've I've discovered that for the most part, super affiliates, with a few exceptions, they've always had access to an audience in the form of an email list of people who were asking to keep them informed about different offers, services, niche topics, and 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 you know information 
uh, on any particular subject. And it could be golfing, could be dating, could be personal development, could be productivity, could be really just anything. And um, I was like, wow, look at that. All the super affiliates are actually mailing. They've got an email list they're sending emails to. Maybe I should get into that. And so for the next, uh, you know, say a couple of years, I, I started exploring that. I started trying to build a list in many different ways and, and, and forms. Eventually, I ended up building a great list of roughly 2,700 people, which at the time for me seemed like a big deal. Of course, today I can generate as many as 2,700 people in a day. Um, but back in the day, that, was, that seemed like a lot. And I remember one day I was mailing for an offer, a ClickBank offer. Um, it was um, it was called the Deadbeat Millionaire. It was by Dan Brock. I, I, I particularly remember the hero image on the website was a guy in his uh, red bathrobe uh, with one sock sort of lazily hanging off of his foot because it wasn't put on correctly with a PlayStation controller in hand and then a bunch of screenshots of him making a lot of money. So uh, I mailed it to my list and I think I made something like 17 sales in, in from that email. Now, you have to remember that at the time I'm making uh, roughly below minimum wage. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm making roughly a thousand, maybe $900 a month. Um, and all of a sudden I make like 27 or 17 sales. Um, and each sale pays about 30 or $40 in commissions. Mm -hmm. So I, at that, that day I made a lot, I made more than half of my monthly income from just one email. And that was it. You mm -hmm. really didn't have to convince me much for, further about why I should build an email list. And I doubled down on, on, on list building in every shape that I could, you know, possibly figure out. Um, I, I kind of made sure that anything that I was doing online from that point forward was governed by one idea, and that is to put people on my email list. And, mm -hmm. you know, never, never looked back since. I don't think I've had since 20, since about 2013 or 2012, I haven't had a month well, yeah, since 2013, I haven't had a month less than $10,000 um, online, right? These days, of course, $10,000 is a, is a good day for me. You know, if I if I don't make 10 yeah. grand in a day, I kind of feel like day wasted. You know, I kind of feel like something is wrong. My system is malfunctioning right now. I need to go take a look. But yeah, back in the day, my goal was to make, uh, actually, my first goal was to make $33, 33 cents a day. I, I particularly remember uh, putting uh, down, uh, exactly, yes, I, because that would that would be enough for me to quit my day job. And I, I remember before bed, I would always get my affirmations notebook and I would, and I would put down, I would do at least one page of, I am making $33.33 .33 per day online easily. And I would like do like a whole page of these affirmations. And uh, I did it for a while until I finally hit that goal. When I did, I switched it to $100 a day so I can hit 3000 a month. And once I hit that, I was like, okay, now we can scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like roughly how much uh, do you make from each email subscriber per month? Right. So right now, or... Should I say last time I calculated, which was about six months ago, um, I basically took the average of the last three months at that time that, that I was earning and divided by the amount of subscribers on my list at the time. And um, I'm making, based on that number, I'm making roughly $27 per email subscriber per month wow. uh, from my list, which, which is something like, which is a number that I keep in mind all the time because- mm -hmm. If you think about it, sometimes you can be generating an email subscriber and you're like, oh, wow, did I just spend $8 on getting this lead? Did I just spend, you know, $15 on getting leads today, depending on how, you know, the advertising is going that month or whatever. And, you know, it'd be like, yeah, I did. But average earning $27 per subscriber per month, I'm still in profit. So I'm good. <laughs> like, you just keep reminding yourself, I'm good. Don't worry. You're still in the red, in, in the black. Uh, you're good. Just keep keep doing what you're doing. But yeah, like this is, um, uh, I, I don't think it's the most accurate metric, to be honest, in terms of like, how do you uh, judge how much money you're making? I still try to look at the first 30 days, the first 60 days, the first 90 days. And it, it, based on where the subscriber will be coming from, the average earning per subscriber will change. 
But even with that in mind, the average does come down to about $27 per subscriber per month. And that's a comforting thought because in that way, as long as I think that way, all I have to do is just focus on getting more people on my list. Got it. Wow. Now you're making me hooked and curious more about, uh, like very, very curious about this. So a, a lot of questions I want to ask you. The first one is like, what's the best time to email your subscribers? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? What is the best timing? Like, is it 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m.? Is it a weekday, a weekend? Based on, like, you've, you've sent probably thousands of, of emails, okay? Like, or yeah. millions, of, you know? Yeah. So what's yeah, the best we, we do send millions of emails uh, at this point. And uh, that, this, I, I wondered this question myself. And here's what I've discovered. Um, first and foremost, you have to understand that each list will be different. And I know it's not the answer that people actually like to hear, but you will have to test and see for yourself what works. And what I recommend is not only looking at the at your open rates or your click-through rate, but also look at the sales. And I'll share and I'll share an example with you why. You see, um, I think up to a couple of years ago, I was mailing at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Eastern, and I was happy with my with my results. But then I noticed I, I had a dip in sales. Like I noticed that people are still clicking, but the sales weren't there. And so what I've discovered is when I switched to mailing at 3 p.m., I had more sales come in because I uh, my guess my guess about that is uh, people have more mental capacity to go check out your offer. They're kind of tired from working for that you know for the day, and they allow themselves to go review offers and you know allow impulse buys to to occur. Um, then for some time I mailed at 3 p.m. and was happy with that, but then all of a sudden noticed a dip in my open rates at 3 p.m. So I switched to 8 p.m. All of a sudden 8 p.m. seems to be working better because maybe. I have a lot of parents on my list, and so they have to put kids to bed before they can have the mental bandwidth and the attention span to, you know, to to engage with me. So uh, then I said, you know what? Let's try something freaky. Let's try to test something that's just really out there. And we started sending at three a.m. We just added another email wow. that went out at three a.m. Eastern. And I was, and most of my list is U.S. and Canada. So I was like, there's no way. I mean, it will test it, but there's no way. <laughs> and there's there's a way. You know, the my list really surprised me. What we noticed is we get really good click-through rate at 3 a.m. So anytime we're mailing an invitation to like an event or something, we will definitely add an email at 3 a.m. because it just seems to be working so well. What I think is going on is, you know, 3 a.m. Eastern is roughly midnight on the West Coast. And so if I've got lot, lots of mm -hmm. people from Texas, from uh, California, right, from all of these states, and it's midnight, and, and they're sort of winding down for the day, feeling bored, yeah. uh, but they're not going to bed, maybe they're still kind of thinking about whatever, um, they will check their email from their phone or their computer, mm -hmm. and it's quiet, right? No one's calling them yeah. at, at midnight. No one's messaging them at midnight. So they'll have more attention to click through to the links that they might have seen earlier that day for me, but decided not to click on. I I, I agree because as a consumer, like I've spent over a hundred thousand dollars on like seminars and courses, and I realized that most of the time I buy stuff online when it's at night. Somehow, like at night, I'm just more active, especially marketers, right? They're normally awake at night, so they they tend to buy stuff and it's quiet. And like I tend to watch webinars at night or learn stuff at night. Etc. Okay, that's great. And um, so roughly, how like if you don't mind sharing, like roughly, how big is your email list or in each? Like, you probably have different businesses, right? So yeah, right now my primary list is roughly fifty thousand people. Um, okay. What I do is I really uh, ensure that I keep it clean. Uh, we really uh, get rid of anyone who didn't open anything uh, within the first uh, two weeks. So really strict with our email hygiene. And it's a lesson I learned actually along the way because uh, just a few years ago, I had a list of over 170,000 people, but I've discovered that it can be tricky to manage that list 
because list attrition is real. You know, you'll have people on your list and they'll be getting your emails all of a sudden. They stop answering, they stop opening, they you go into spam, whatever. And if you're mailing 170,000 people, and even if it's small, if a small percentage of those emails goes to spam or don't get opened, these signals they are being pushed through to the Google and the Yahoo and the Hotmail and the AOLs. So you're 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 sending you're sending this message out. As saying, hey, a big portion of my list doesn't really care for my emails. So what I've discovered would be uh, better, even though it hurts sometimes to just remove people from your list, I discovered that um, it actually makes a lot more sense to keep my list really engaged and really responsive, ensuring that only the people who open my emails continue to receive them. Um, every now and again, I'll do like a reactivation campaign for those who didn't, but oftentimes I won't even email the whole thing. Like even if I've got 50,000 people on the list, oftentimes I'll send the email out to 17 or 20,000 instead, because I really want to focus on the people who have been opening recently, right? So I'll take the, like, like the last 90 day openers and I'll, you know, and I'll email them. And if, uh, those who didn't open in a while, I'll push them through like a sequence or something that I'm trying to re-engage them, but that's going to be separate from like a promotion that I'm running that particular month or week. Um, so list hygiene, I think it's become a lot more important in the last few years, especially since COVID, um, because more businesses and more people have decided they are going to get into the email marketing game, which they should, because it's the single most profitable thing you can do, honestly. Like if you're doing any kind of activity online, I mean, email is where the vast majority of the sales happen. So you, you definitely want to be playing that game. But because of this sheer influx of new blood into the inbox, um, the Gmail algorithm and all the other algorithms, they now have to be more strict and rigid about who makes it through. So, you know, the techniques for mailing uh, back, say, 10 years ago, they don't necessarily work anymore the same way. Uh, now you have to watch a different set of metrics in order to, uh, to get your messages delivered. And one of them is your email list hygiene, because whatever the domain you're using to mail, like you're from domain, meaning my emails go out from Igor at listbuildinglifestyle.com. So I have to ensure that this domain does not collect you know, negative signals all day long, because if it does, it's only a short matter of time before it's going to get blacklisted. Got it. And what would you say is like a healthy open rate, a healthy click-through rate for email marketing in general? Like a I'd, say, I'd say on a brand new list, anything about 5% is good. Anything at 15 and above is amazing. Uh, as you grow okay. your list and as you email more, then you want to be aiming towards 20% and above whenever you're sending out an email. Now, there are some instances where these numbers will be skewed. For example, um, like I can send out a promotion to my whole list of 50,000, but then I'll actually take only the people who opened my email and do another follow-up email to those people. So if I do that, I can expect a 60% open rate from those. It doesn't necessarily reflect my, my whole list, right? But it does help me get more positive signals for Gmail because I'm saying, hey, look, I just sent out an email and 60% of the people who received it opened it. So Gmail will be like, oh, Igor, I'm impressed. This is very good, right? So I, I want to like impress Gmail as much as I can with my open rates. Um, so I, I think that the name of the game is not just looking at your general um, open rate. I think it's also about segmenting your list in a smart way that allows you to manipulate that data. Because if you're mailing the people who are already receptive towards you know, what you're sending, then you're automatically um, increasing your domain reputation, kind of improving your... Uh, branding, if you will, with with Gmail, and and by doing so, you will inevitably inbox better with everybody else. Got it. Okay. So recently, okay, I've always been using Aweber for the past few years, and I've gotten like a twenty to twenty five percent open rate. And I wanted to shift over to another email provider called Salesy. And when I tried to shift it over, I uploaded the whole list to Salesy, but my open rates were like one to three percent. Okay. So what do you recommend I, I do? So in this case, when you shift to a new provider, a couple of things to, to note. First, you have to do something called authentication with the, new, uh, with the new sender. Because what might have happened, you've had your authentication done with Aweber and that domain was associated with Aweber. 
And then all of a sudden you're mailing from salesy and the uh, Gmail and other filters are picking it up and they'll be like, oh, this doesn't seem right because we've been getting signals from this domain with Aweber. All of a sudden it's coming from this. Maybe it's spoofing. Maybe it's like you have to basically, it, it's sort of like confirming your identity with mm -hmm. the email gods. Got right. It. So if, you, if you've been mailing with Aweber and all of a sudden you're coming from salesy and they're like, doesn't seem legit. There's some kind of like domain identity theft happening. So you always have to authenticate first. Then, of okay. course, you have to remember that um, wh whichever company you're using, they have their own set of dom uh, set of IPs. And, um, you know, for the listeners to better understand what's the difference between the mailing IP and a mailing domain. And I'm sorry for going into like this advanced stuff. I'm not sure how sure. advanced the audience like, is. Like, yeah. Just teach this as though you're teaching, and then the audience will naturally get the value. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so the domains are responsible for, um, for you inboxing. Just as I'm sorry, the IP, the IP pool from which the email is going out is responsible for your inboxing just as much as the domain. Now, domain is something you control. Domain is yours. You buy it. You authenticate it with the email uh, uh, software you're using. But the IP is basically it's, it's a physical server that's actually dispatching the email and you don't really control it so if the salesies ips are not really great um and meaning that a faberber's ips are a little bit better they're whitelisted or they've been vetted over a period of time and salesies have not been because i know that aweber actually does spend a lot of money on keeping their ips really clean whitelisting them with all kinds of spam lists etc then you know you will naturally get a you know you will have a harder time inboxing even if your your email content remains exactly the same that's another thing that people don't consider the email content itself does trigger different um uh, different filters different uh things right so you can send the exact same email content from a different email provider and all of a sudden you know you're not inboxing so all of that because of how many variables there are at any given point, it's always like a mix. It's not like, like this salad, right? Where you're taking like a bunch of parameters and you're kind of moving them all into one, into mm -hmm. one uh, area, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes we just, we're just not aware of which parameter is dropping the ball or which parameter is missing. But in this case, I think what might've been missing for you is either an SPF or DKIM authentication or something like that. Got it. So like when I receive my own emails from a salesy, it always shows up in spam. And uh, I, 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 had a, I had a mastermind with another email marketer and he said that you just had to copy and paste a code, like a, a text and say like a disclaimer and it will get past the spam filters. So I'm not so sure about that. I could try that. Um, do you have any other tips or like any, any trade, uh, like trade secrets or any like tips and tricks about this email marketing game? Yeah, absolutely. First off, what you mentioned, the big disclaimer, what it what it is, um, the technique there, and I do use it. Uh, it's a solid technique. Um, I haven't seen it increase my sales, to be honest with you, because my deliverability was already good before I tried it. But um, the idea is to paste a really big uh, disclaimer speaking this either legal or formal language. Mm -hmm. Such as, you know, Alaric Ong is a well-respected, you know, marketing authority, um, you know, and whatever, like just not nothing sales, nothing marketing, you know, nothing is just purely formal stuff that you would put on your on your MBA profile or on your LinkedIn, you know what I mean? Like has to be really, really formal stuff. Like as if you're presenting yeah. in front of a judge and, a, and the district attorney about who the hell yeah. you are. And so you make it big enough, and what it does is it offsets the ratio, okay, this is really important, the ratio between marketing content and mm -hmm. total content of the email. So let's say your marketing content of your email, your actual email swipe you're sending out, let's say it's 300 words, and let's say your disclaimer mm -hmm. is 800 words. Mm -hmm. So you've now got 1,100 words in that email out of which only 300 and something words are marketing words. I see. And so by, yeah, by doing that, you might trick Gmail. This is Gmail specific, by the way. You might trick Gmail into saying, oh, you know what? The bulk of the content in this email is actually formal. So we're going to let it inbox because apparently this is a formal email between colleagues, 
right? Some, some kind of a, yeah. So uh, usually this trick is used to try and get out of the promotions tab, not so much the spam. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, did that work for you? Um, okay, so like that marketer told me to, like all the things white so that against a white background, right? It, the words don't exist, but to Gmail, the words exist. I think, yeah, it probably increased my open rates a little bit, but I haven't tried that on sales because my, my open rates on Aweber has already been pretty good. So, I mean, yeah, it, it was still about 20 to 25%. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what you will find if you use it. By the way, you don't have to make it uh, white on white. You can actually leave it as yeah. is. You can make a really big disclaimer. People are used to disclaimers. Like it's not something that people be like, "What is th what is this?" You know, voodoo magic in this email. Oh, wow, how do I read it this way or that way? Like people have seen disclaimers before. They'll be like, "Okay, fine." I mean, uh, they'll just scroll through it. But um, what you will find is you might just bump it a little bit if you're already good but if you're if you've had a terrible open rate then you know it's worth a try so if anyone's listening yeah. and they're really getting a, a really bad open rate they can try it but i think there is more to the story because like i said this is primarily used to get from get out of the promotions tab uh, rather than getting out of the spam if you're hitting the spam you're either mailing out content that gmail really doesn't like you're either mailing out from a domain that is blacklisted or it's brand new and therefore it does not have a reputation. You're either, and you could not be authenticating yourself because one, for example, one thing that people don't do and don't know how to do is they almost never, and I'm talking from experience because I help people build lists and I teach them how to do it. Um, uh, people almost never authenticate their mailing domain with Google Postmaster tools. Now, Google Postmaster Tools is a free service that Google provides in order for you to say, uh, okay, Google, I'd like to start, you know, emailing people like as a, as a business, as a marketer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Google says, you know what? That's totally fine, Igor. But before you do, here's a snippet of code that we want you to put on your website to prove that this particular domain, which could be something like my domain is listbuildinglifestyle.com, right? So I have to go to my listbuildinglifestyle.com domain, go to my server and place this little text file on my server. Now what that does is now it sends a signal back to Google and say, listbuildinglifestyle.com is owned by Igor. And therefore it's not like some weirdo that's trying to pretend he's Igor and you know scam people it's actually legitimate right so it's kind of like getting almost like if you wanted to start a a uh, restaurant and you wanted to feed people you would have to invite the uh, the uh i don't know what what the government agency is like the fda or uh yeah. you know the, the 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 food administration to be like well let's take a look at your restaurant is it clean yes show me the paperwork do you own this place yes now let's see the menu. Okay, where do you get your uh, tomatoes and then your poultry? Okay, cool. Yeah, mm -hmm, got it. Okay, here's a seal of approval. You can now go, you know, sell kebab to people. Well, the same way Google is trying to verify your digital presence, so they know that whichever email is coming through your domain, it's actually a legitimate email. So that's another really common mistake when people end up in the spam. Oftentimes, that's the reason why they really haven't taken the steps to authenticate themselves with services like Gmail. And as a result, you know, it doesn't really matter what they mail. It doesn't really matter what content they put in the email. They'll, they're they pretty much destined to never see the light of the inbox. Got it. And so what's your main way of doing your list right now? Is it from ads? And what's the that you're using? Like, is it generating people to a free book or a webinar or what? Yeah, so I'm the sort of guy that's all, that's always looking for the for the edge. Uh, if you followed me around for a while, you probably know it's it's coming across pretty pretty obviously. So I've got a book funnel uh, that you can check out at igorsbook.com. I got a podcast which you can check out at lisbonlifestyleshow.com. I got uh, oh, tons of webinar funnels. I got the VSL funnel. I've got lead magnets. I've got everything. Um, it, it's it's really what I've discovered is you can never have too many different forms of funnels. But mm -hmm. if someone's listening to this and they're brand new, what they really need to start is a landing page where they're collecting email addresses. And I would mm -hmm. highly recommend checking out something called email drops. Email drops. 
email drops. Yeah. What I've, what I've discovered over the years is that, you know, if I'm looking to build an email list, um, what can, what can be better than having people join my email list who are already on other people's lists, who are already conditioned to receive open and read emails, click on those emails and actually buy from those emails. And so as a result, I've, I've started looking into this and I say, how can I tap other people's email lists to do it? Because mm -hmm. these days, uh, there are so many people and so many companies and so many content creators and influencers who have email lists. And it's so easy now to go in and tap their lists uh, for a promotion. So this way, they're actually mailing you to their to their audience. You're getting primed people who already went through all the qualification steps. And you're also getting an instant credibility boost because whoever owns that email database is actually giving you an endorsement. So... I mean, it's really the best of, of every possible world because you're getting qualified leads who are interested in your nature topic. You're getting a credibility boost by the uh, list owner and it's all happening automatically without you having to go and like build an SEO site for the next two years. Would you call it JV the same thing as like a joint venture? Or it's like they're affiliating for you. You can structure this both ways. It can be done as a JV where you just make some okay. sort of a deal with the, whoever owns the list and you say, look, you run my offer, you run my landing page, and I will give you, you know, a commission. For example, I've got an offer where I pay commission on a thousand dollar product, but I also got an offer where I actually pay on a pay per lead basis, meaning that if somebody's opting in, I'm paying for the actual opt in, I'm paying for the actual email address. Um, but you also can structure this in the form of um, a paid promotion where you're paying up front for the promotion, where you're saying, you know what, um, I'm going to give you this email, right? This email copy. If you just send this email copy, I'll pay you, say, 50 cents for every single click you deliver. So whoever's owning the email database, there's really no risk for them at all because they don't have to make sales for you. They don't have to like do anything other than just blasting out the email you just gave them. Of course, they can tweak the email to fit their voice and, and preferences. But, you know, for the most part, they just have to copy and paste an email and they'll make money. Now, at the same time, um, you will be usually paying, with this arrangement, you'll be usually paying way less per click than you would if you were to run Facebook ads or, or Google AdWords or any other form of advertising. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen in a while now, you know, people paying like 50 or 30 cents per click for anything. Um, but with email drops, that's actually possible. Got it. And so is which is your primary like which is your main way? Like it's probably like 80 20, right? So like which is your main way of getting traffic? Yeah. So the way I operate is I'm paranoid. Um I have um I, I remember clearly what it's like to be poor. And I have spoken to enough uh millionaires now, thanks to my podcast primarily, um, to know that almost every millionaire has a story about how they lost everything. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they were off to a great start before industry changes or before partner leaves them or before they get divorced and wife takes half or before, you know, uh, they hit depression, before they start doing drugs. I mean, there's so many, so many like things that can go wrong. So I, I was very mindful of that from the get go. And as soon as I hit my first quarter of a million dollars in a year, um, I started thinking, okay, so how do I now uh, create almost a bulletproof like um uh, business for myself, where even if there's a shakeup of some kind, I, I won't be kind of cough, caught off guard. And I figured that one of the most vulnerable areas is if I only have one source of leads, I will always be vulnerable. I will always have to be looking over my shoulders. And then if anything does happen um, and the carpet is pulled from underneath me, uh, it's going to take me a long time to recover unless I get really lucky. So I kind of figured let me assume that that's going to happen. Let me just assume that it's going to happen in six months. And, you know, I need to start building another way or another, like imagine if my business is a table, right? Um, I have to make, basically put a bunch of legs under the table. So if one of them goes off, um, 
I'm not, the table doesn't fall off and doesn't flip. Oh, yeah. um, and so I decided to kind of build as many traffic sources as I possibly can, uh, obviously mm -hmm. within reason, so I can juggle all of them at the same time. And so mm -hmm. now um, there's no, for me, there's no such thing as a primary traffic source, because I simply try to maintain a balance where I will kind of like maintain the volume of traffic from all the different traffic sources. And when one of them kind of goes down versus the other, while this one's still carrying me through, I'll, I can work on, on building this one back up. So now it's email drops. It, a lot of it uh, also comes from Google. I also do CPA networks. And of course, I do joint ventures. So I have four solid, um, four solid uh, sources of leads that I know I can rely on. So if at any point, even one of them goes off, um, I can say, you know what? Okay, I, I still got three others left, but let me go and work on this one that got, you know, that that broke, so I can I can be back on track again. It's all fueled 100% by really unhealthy par paranoia. So um, I'm not sure I'm not sure if anyone can relate to that, but that's the way my brain works at this point. And it's mm -hmm. only got worse over the years, to be honest with you, because, uh, you know, as, as I grow older, I take on more responsibilities, I make investments, you know, I have more children, you know, more commitments, uh, like want to buy a house in a different country so I can have two homes. Like the more the more responsibilities I take on, the more paranoid I become. Got it. And, and right now when you run ads to your webinar, for example, like roughly how much is your cost per lead? Okay, uh, you 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 got cut off there a bit. So if, okay. what I heard is Nowadays, um, when you run ads to your webinar, roughly yeah. what is your cost per lead? If you don't mind me asking. Right. So cost per lead for a webinar funnel can actually range from as little as eight dollars to as okay. high as twenty five thirty. Uh, so okay. if you're doing a webinar funnel these days, it's really difficult to sustain it unless you're selling a $2,000 or $2,500 item. Um, because selling something for less than that, let's say if you were selling something for $500 or $300 for a webinar, uh, you simply won't be able to sustain the conversions and, and the cost per sale. Got it, got it. Okay, so um, one last question. How can people follow you or do you have a, like, do you have a, yeah. Do you have a freebie yeah, to give? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There, there are a couple of places where you can follow me. Uh, I'm pretty active on YouTube. I put out uh, a, a lot of content, but the primary way to follow me would probably be to listen to my podcast at listbuildinglifestyleshow.com. And I would also like for you to grab a copy of my book. Um, it's called The List Building Lifestyle, Confessions of an Email Millionaire. And if you go to igorsbook.com, I'll print this book for free for you. And I'll only ask you to chip in on shipping and handling. But when you do, I'll also throw in $3,200,000 in bonuses that include some of my courses on traffic generation, some of my uh, uh, landing page templates, and then a bunch more. And I do it because if, I, uh, if you go on Amazon, which you can, and, and go find this book on Amazon, you will basically get it, but I will not get your email address. Uh, so in order to ethically bribe you to get your email address, uh, you know, I ask you to go to igorsbook.com and go uh, pick it up there. Now, uh, with that said, when you get it and you read it, if you like it, uh, I would appreciate if you go to Amazon and actually post a review about it, because apparently the way people make decisions today is they judge everything against Amazon. And we do have like a really good rating on Amazon. So I want to keep that going. Awesome. Thank you so much for having, uh, like for being on this show. And I learned a lot and I'm sure the audience will learn a lot as well. Thank you. All right.